Hello, welcome to lab seven. So this lab is gonna be focused on a couple of tasks, um, mostly related around um, network security. Uh, we're gonna be setting up SSH, uh, which you should remember a little bit from ULI 101, but we'll go over it here. And um, additionally, a big part of the lab will be focused on using IP tables. IP tables is our um, firewall utility that we are using. Uh, we installed it at the beginning of lab one. Um, so now we're going to learn how to configure it, which will be quite important for assignment number two. Okay, so to start with, uh, what I've done is I started up CentOS 1 and CentOS 3 VMs um, as per instructions. Um, they're going to ask us to create a file, so I'm just going to do that. I'm going to call, uh, let's do bi my file that text, and I'll just like hello cruel world, something like that. Uh, really doesn't matter. This is just going to be a test uh, for us to be working with some things, and basically as a bit of review from ULI 101. Um, so <clears throat> the first command I'm going to show is SCP. We're going to point at myfile.txt and uh, all I'm going to do is throw this into my matrix. Um, so the instructions the instructions that you have um, on OPS Wiki might be a little bit out of date, but if you're using SenecaC.on.ca, it should redirect just fine. Um, and I'm just going to throw this in my home. Uh, so this should do it. I run this. This command, um, or sorry, this uh, this message is basically saying we've never connected to Matrix from this computer before. Are you sure that you want to keep this fingerprint? And are you sure that you're connecting to the right place? The answer is yes. And okay, so all I can do here is enter my password. And we should go through. If everything's gone according to plan, you should see that little message over there. It says we transferred a 100 bytes, 100% 100 of the bytes that we wanted to. And the next thing we can do is just use SSH to get into matrix and make sure that that um, file is exactly where we expect it to be. So I'm just gonna do this. And um, in, instead of just like logging in and taking a look, what we can do is just like pass it one of these, um, uh, what, what am I trying to say? Um, we can use SSH to be passing it a command and it'll just execute that command. So we'll do this, we'll type in the password again. And there we go, we should see that the file is there. And if we really want to, we can go in and um, <clears throat> do this. Uh, maybe we'll cat my file that check text just to see what's inside. And once again, type in the password. And there we go. So we see what was inside the file. Okay. So the first thing we're going to be doing is just verifying that we've got everything that we need installed. So um, on C7 host, I'm going to log in as root. And hopefully you remember uh, one of these commands uh, just for checking on packages. So I'm going to use rpm-qa. I'm going to grep for SSH. We're just going to find what's installed on here that is related to SSH. And we run this command, and what we should see eventually um, is open SSH clients and open SSH server. And yes, there they are. So that's great. The next thing we'll do is um, take a look at what service is running. So I'm going to use systemctl status sshd. Um, so this would be our SSH server. Um, typically, we haven't talked about this before, but we probably should. Um, you'll see a lot of these services ending with the D, so HTTPD, SSHD. Uh, I believe the D stands for daemon um, or daemon, which basically means a program running in the background, which is what these all are. So let's run this, and we see, we see sorry, that this is OpenSSH, server is running, and it's active, and everything is good. 
So that's great. So let's do one more thing before we get started. Um, let's take a look at port numbers. Um, so if you remember from the last lab, it may have, may have been a while since you took a look at it, um, but we use netstat to basically um, gather information about ports that are open. So let's take a look here and we should get this. Let me maximize this so it's easier to read. Um, we should get a bunch of information here about what is open, what is being listened on. We can see at the very bottom here that we have TCP 6 and we also have TCP over here. So if we take a look at this, uh, we should see that SSHD is running. It's listening on port 22. Uh, which is very standard, right? Um, that's usually what you see 99% of the time. Um, so that's great. Uh, that means that we have SSH server running on C7 host and we can receive connections. And so what does that mean that we have the server running on C7 host? Well, okay, for example, this is me on, oops, all right, one second there. So this is me on um, CentOS 3, for example. And I am going to log in as root. And what I can do here is SSH onto C7 host. Um, I could use SCP to transfer files and everything like that. Um, what I'll make sure that I do is use my regular user. And um, actually, no, let's just do root. Let's see if we can do that. So I'm going to try and log in as root at C7 host. And I'll be asked for a password. I'm going to type in the password. And there I am. I'm logged in as root. I can go in and take a look at, um, let's see, home slash browser. And I can say the myfile.txt that I just created a few minutes ago. Um, so this is okay, but I think what you'll find is that this is actually kind of a security issue, right? Um, because if you think about it, root is a very, very, very common uh, username. And so if people can log in as root, they already have one piece of the puzzle, then all they have to do is really guess your password. Um, so one of the things that is a very, very good practice is to disable logging in as root um, with a password, okay? So we're gonna talk uh, more about this stuff as we go. Okay. I'm going to click in here and log in. So just as a frame of reference, I know we talk about internet security and stuff and sometimes it seems very, um, abstract or kind of like not a problem for right now half the time we just want things to work right uh, and we don't really want to add the extra uh, complexity of having to deal with security um, but I can tell you uh, from my experience um, we have several servers uh, for uh, CDOT which is the Center for Development of Open Technology and um, those public facing servers would be um, tested by hackers like on a constant basis so you could fire up your terminal and be reading the logs as they come in and have people trying to log in as root from all over the world trying to figure out what your password was and there's a lot of things that we did to try and mitigate that risk well basically one thing that we did have on all these servers um, as a default was to um, not allow people to log in as root. They would have to log in as the regular user and if it, they had root access they could get it after the fact. Um, so that's a very good practice. That's something I even do with like if I have like little machines at home that have ports open I'm gonna make sure that nobody can try to log in as root and try to figure out my password. Okay so to do that here I am in CentOS 1. Um, we're going to open up a terminal and let's log in as root. And there is a file over here that I'm going to want to edit. Um, so I'm going to use vim 
etc ssh ssh d config there we go so once we open that you can see that we have got a lot of options here you can see here where we've got um, uh, let's see so this is maybe something where we're changing the port uh, I don't know if that's part of the lab over here uh, but let's go through um, so we're gonna let's look for something called allow users so I'm just gonna go to the top of this I'm gonna use slash to do a search and I'm gonna type in allow users so we did not find that interesting okay uh, oh we're gonna have to add this option so I'm just gonna do that at the very bottom because that's always good practice I'm gonna say allow users and I'm going to use my regular account name which is going to be eBrower okay oh sorry I'm skipping a step what I should be doing is looking for permit root login <laughs> okay so a couple things let's go permit let's look for that so I found permit root login and what I'm gonna do you'll notice anything with a hash in front of it is commented out okay so I'm going to uncomment this and I'm going to change this to no so basically what this means once I do this change and restart the daemon restart the service basically um, anyone trying to SSH with that root user at whatever it's gonna fail automatically it's gonna fail outright and they won't have any permission to do anything the other thing that I've done is at the very bottom of this I'm allowing only one user and the name of that user is me right um, it's always probably better to sort of um, block everyone and have a whitelist rather than just sort of like have this ad hoc blacklist right um, probably won't work if you know we don't have a user set up on that machine anyway but if it's something like matrix you know you could even guess one of those users okay so we've done those two changes we've allowed users and we have turned permit root login to no so I'm just gonna save this and what I'll do is systemctl restart sshd okay so that's gone so the next thing I'm gonna do let's go back to c7 host which is this guy right here okay and so what I'm gonna try to do is ssh to c7 host so from c7 so hard sorry to CentOS 1. So let me try with the root first, yeah? So root 1 at CentOS 1. First time you're trying this, do you want to do it? Yes. Let me type in the password. So that was the correct password. It's not letting me in because I'm root. So let me control C out of that. The next thing I'll try to do is to SSH as my username Oops, try to spell that right there we go let's give this a shot and there we are so now we've successfully logged in as ebrower and I can do su dash so I still have root privileges right um, but I don't get them outright so this is better practice so the next thing you're going to be doing with this is to create a user called other and what you should find as soon as you've created this other user and you try to SSH uh, you won't be able to because you're not on the whitelist but you can add that other user to the whitelist and it should work so what I have done uh, logged into CentOS 1 um, I have entered the commands that you know from lab 4 um, so password dash m other um, this should create a home directory and I've given a password uh, I gave it a weak password so it complains but it lets you do it and I can hit control D to log out and let me just log out okay so I'm back at C7 host and what I can try to do is SSH as other at CentOS 1 and let me enter that weak password and it won't let me in so 
Um, as you can see, our security measures are working pretty well. Uh, what I can do is maybe, let's go back in over here. Let's go to allow users over here. I'm gonna hit A to append, and I'm just gonna add another uh, user over here. Do the same thing, restart the service. Now I can jump back over here. Let's give it a shot. Let's see if it works. Let's me do it now. And it lets me in. So hopefully that demonstrates how these things all work. So let's see. They're just going to ask us to do a couple more things before we sort of move on to the next section. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to copy this. Uh, file over here. So we're just making a backup basically. And uh, notice I'm logged in as I'm logged into CentOS 1. Uh, SSH D SSH D underscore config. And I'll just throw that into the my regular users um, home directory. Oh, sorry. Let me uh, let me log in as root, and I'll try this again. Log in as root, and I have to type in the whole command again because it doesn't remember my history. But that's fine. So I'll throw that in home. Unr sshd d config dot bk. Okay, so backup created, and I'll use this. To basically for others and groups. I don't like that. For me, it's always groups and others, right? Um, I'm going to add read permissions to that backup uh, command, that backup file. Okay, so that is done. Um, one thing we can do is uh, show you uh, where the um, log is for different uh, login attempts and stuff like that. So let's do a thing where we're going to go. And uh, take a look at, let's do cat, actually let's do less because this might be a large file. Uh, log secure. And you can see this is definitely a log and you can definitely see, um, you know, where we have connections. This is January 27th. So if we get to the very end, let's do capital G to get to the near the end. Um, so if you pay attention, you can see that this is this should look um, pretty similar. Um, so for example, accepted password for other from 192.168.235.1, which is C7 host. Uh, we just set that up right from last lab, basically. Um, so yes, indeed, this is a log. I'd recommend taking a few moments just to sort of read through and make sure you understand what you're getting. Um, Okay, so now we get into investigation two. Um, for this beginning part, what we're going to do is uh, move to our CentOS three, and we're just going to sort of um, go through some of these uh, netcat netstat commands again. So let's go netstat at dash at unp. So that's going to give us a list of uh, ports and stuff like that. Um, if you'll notice, it looks like we've got one that is there for C7 host and it's established. Okay, interesting. Um, so one thing we'll do is uh, let's do SSH OPS 235 at CentOS 3. Isn't it weird that we are using SSH to connect to our own machine? Oh, no, I'm sorry. You know what I'm looking at right now. Um, I'm not logged in as C at CentOS 3. I'm uh, logged in at C7 host. So always make sure that you are paying attention to your command prompt. So let me just hit Control D. And OK, so my connection to C7 host is closed. Let's try that again. <laughs> throw, I'll throw the, the, the blooper into this video so you can see we all make mistakes, you know. Um, let's do netstat atunp. Okay, so here's what we get. Um, here's a bunch of connections. We have port 22 that is open and listening. 
let's do SSH OPS 235 at CentOS 3. So what we're basically doing is using SSH to connect to our own machine, uh, which is not something that you will ever do, uh, but it's good for an example. So here I type in the password again. Okay, so there we are. Uh, let's see if we can. No, we don't have any of that. So we'll just type in netstat atunp once again. And this time you can take a look and you'll see that there's something that is established here from 235.13, which is, as you know, that CentOS 3, right? And so that basically tells, this gives you an example of what Netstat looks like when you actually have a established connection. And you can see, yeah, we are indeed CentOS 3. So let's log out. I'll just use Control D. Uh, so we're back at CentOS 3 now. And um, yeah, I would take a moment now just to record your observations, and then we'll talk about the next part of this. Okay, so now we get to the moment where we get to talk a little bit about uh, private public keys. Basically, um, encryption and stuff like this is a huge topic. It is something that you basically study on its own. You know, people go into internet security and stuff like that. Um, uh, but basically, you know, modern life would not work without encryption and public and private keys and all this stuff. And um, to basically water it down, I'll give you an analogy. Uh, let's say that you uh, get a membership at a gym, okay? And they provide you with a locker, but you have to provide your own lock uh, to keep your stuff safe, basically. So what you do, go to Canadian Tire, hope a hardware store or whatever buy it on Amazon I don't care go you buy a, a padlock basically when you buy a padlock it comes with a key and a lock and those two things go together um, no other key will fit into that lock and that lock won't accept any other key that key is your private key so you keep that on your keychain and you carry it with you and you don't let it out of your sight and you don't lend it out to friends or anything like that. The lock is a like the public key basically. It can live out in public and we can basically uh, trust that it will be safe out in the wide world. Um, once you go to the gym you use your private key and it matches your public key and you're able to you know exchange stuff into your locker and walk away and everything is safe um, we're about to essentially do the same sort of thing there's a couple of steps basically the first step is that we generate two keys a key pair right we're going to Canadian Tire and we're buying the the lock and the key at the same time whatever we're just generating it instead of buying it right and the next thing that we're going to do is make sure that we copy over the public key to our public place, the server or whatever, right? The private key is going to sit on our machine and we're going to keep that very, very safe and we're not going to share that. So that's essentially the process. Uh, we'll get into it right now. Actually, one more thing. So if you want to get a little bit more in depth with how all this stuff works, um, I can recommend a channel on YouTube called Computer File. Um, so I think the first video here sort of talks about more about how public key cryptograph cryptography works, basically. Um, it's very similar to how HTTPS works and everything like that. Of course, with HTTPS, there's never a moment where you're you know generating keys and copying them over. So that's when certificates and all this other stuff sort of comes into play. And it's a whole other barrel of worms that, honestly, I probably don't know enough to talk about confidently. But uh, I recommend that you take some time and just learn about it. Okay, so for the next part of this, uh, we're going to log in uh, to our CentOS 2 machine. So let me do that now. Why is my, my caps lock was on for some reason? Okay, there we go. Okay, logged on to CentOS 2. And uh, let's just verify. Um, yes, indeed, CentOS 2. Okay, that's great. Um, 
So we're going to make sure that we are logged in as the regular new user. Don't log in as root for this one. Okay? Do not log in as root to this one. Basically, when we're doing SSH uh, stuff like that, we want to make sure that we are SSHing as regular users. And then once we're logged in, we can, you know, escalate to root privileges or whatever. Um, but let's get started. So the first thing we're going to do is SSH keygen. We're going to run this. Um, the first thing we're going to do, it's going to ask you for the location. Um, the default is this. And uh, we're going to accept the default. And the next thing it's going to do is ask for a key phrase, uh, a passphrase, basically. Um, so I'm going to leave that up to you. Uh, you can leave it blank. Um, I honestly leave it blank quite often. Um, but uh, it's usually good practice to give it a passphrase or something that's going to be difficult to try and figure out. Um, I have, For this one, I'm just going to leave it blank. So I'll hit Enter. I'm going to hit it, Enter again. And you get something like this. So this is generating a, like, a nice little fingerprint or whatever. And what you should be able to see, uh, if we go into this location here, CD SSH, uh, we can see IDRSA and IDRSA.pub. One of these is your private key and one of these is your public key. Take a look at the permissions for these two files. Which one do you think is public and which one do you think is private? Answer, the one that's private has fewer permissions, right? Anyway, um, so the next thing we got to do, now that we have purchased our lock, we want to make sure that we take our lock and basically uh, put it in the remote place where we want to keep stuff safe. So the way that we can do this is using ssh copy id. Okay, so this is the command. What this is basically going to do is transfer that public key to another place. Uh, we'll enter our password uh, one time, and then we should be able to um, log in without using our password. So kind of interesting. Let me make sure that CentOS 3 is running right now. So in a lot of ways, um, using uh, public keys is safer than using passwords. Uh, so it's always good practice. And it also basically saves you a whole lot of time uh, from typing your password over and over and over again. I'm sure you know from you know like running check scripts and stuff like that um, that it can be pretty annoying to have to do that all the time. Okay, so CentOS three. I'm just going to go verify, and I'm going to make sure that the spelling of this is all correct. So we're pointing it at the public key. We're specifying that public key, and then we're also giving it the location where we want to send it, right? So here we go. Gonna ask yes. It's gonna ask us for the password. If all goes according to plan, uh, this should be the last time we have to enter that uh, password. So now it's saying uh, try logging into this machine with SSH OPS 235 at CentOS 3. So let's do that. There we go, we're in. So, and just to verify, uh, okay, so we have nothing in the home directory right now, but that's fine, that's totally fine. Uh, I can use IP address, I can use host name just to verify what we've got, or I can also use that netstat command. Let's try that. And we should have an established connection. Yes, there we go. Local address is dot 13, so that's CentOS 3. The foreign address is dot 12, so that's CentOS 2, and uh, we have set up an SSH connection. Okay, so we've been using SSH primarily for uh, logging into remote machines and uh, typing terminal commands into them, right? Like ULI, basically, you know, you log into Matrix and you do stuff on Matrix and you do whatever. Um, but we don't have to use it like that. Um, for example, with SCP, what we've been doing is transferring data 
over that SSH connection securely. Um, so SSH basically allows us to send data securely. And since we're sending data securely, we can also use it to open graphical user interfaces. Um, the, the process to do this is slightly different, but um, well, let's get into it. So let, for this one, we're going to be doing um, C7 host and CentOS 1. So I'll make sure that CentOS 1 is running. There it is. And I'm going to grab this one over here. Um, so let me, as C7 host, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in ssh-x-c um, or just dash capital X capital C. Um, so the X option is going to allow us to send window information and the dash C is going to can compress the information as we send it. So our performance should be eh, pretty okay. And I'm going to type in my username over here and CentOS1. Okay. So we're going to ask for a password. There we go. So now that I'm in here, I can type in gedit. And I have this uh, terminal window opened up here. So I'm going to type in just something. Hi, CentOS1. This is C7 hosts. Just checking in, blah, 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 something like that. Uh, I'm going to type this in, SSH XC example. And so I'm just going to be saving this in my home directory over there. And I can save it. And I'm going to exit. And as soon as I exit, you'll notice there's some, you know, error messages over here, but there's always error messages like this whenever you're opening up graphical user interfaces, interface programs or whatever. Um, this should not get in your way. And what I can do is just like log out here. Okay. Now, if I go over to CentOS 1, let me close this. Um, I can take a look in my home directory. And you will see that there is a file that was created here. Uh, remotely basically um, so as you can see I can basically open up graphical user interfaces um, the performance is usually pretty good but it depends okay and so for the final investigation of this lab we're going to be working with firewalls um, so if you remember what we did was replace firewall D with IP tables IP tables is a little bit older um, some people prefer it. It's not deprecated, um, so it should be fine. The basic idea with fire, uh, firewalls is that you have a chain of rules and packets come in, and if they match any of these rules, then an action is going to be taken on them. You might choose to accept the packet, you might choose to reject it, drop it, or just like log it that it's coming in. Um, if there's no match, then we move on to the next rule and the next rule and the next rule, basically. Um, so that sort of uh, specifies like priorities of things that you want to do if you really want to make sure that some things are coming through. Um, if you, for example, if you really want to make something secure, um, near the end of the chain, you might have something that is just going to be dropping all connections. But that means that a rule that comes before is going to be accepting some specific packets. Okay, so anyway, we're going to be working with a C7 host uh, for the for the rest of this investigation, basically. Um, so let's get into it. Uh, one of the first commands we're going to do here is IP tables dash L, and we'll just take a look at what we get as the um, as the output. So let me try this. IP tables dash L. Okay, must be root. So if you get that, make sure you log in as root. There we go. So let's try that again. IP tables oops, dash L. So what this should be doing is listing stuff for us. Um, you'll see that we have three different chains here. We have an input chain, a forward chain, and an output chain. OK, 
Okay, so similarly, we can type in IP tables. One sec. We can type in IP tables dash L and uh, specify one of these uh, chains, and we'll just get that chain specifically that we can take a look at. Um, so when you're reading the notes, you should see that um, chain input deals with uh, packets coming into this server, so into C7 host. Um, the output chain is dealing with packets leaving our server. And uh, forward is basically um, packets that are being routed between two, two other servers. Okay, so now that we have looked at um, our IP tables rules that are there by default, what we're going to do next is flush them, which means basically we're going to get rid of them. Um, I'm going to use dash F to flush. Um, this is going to clear the rules for, let's say, input. So I'm going to do that now. And we can do this again. We can take a look. As you can see, it's all gone. Um, it might take a little bit extra time, so it's so usually good to verify. Now I'm going to do IP tables dash F, and let's just take a look at everything now. So now we've got a clean set of firewall rules. They're all gone. So one good practice um, is to be setting a general overall policy, uh, which is default. Um, and a good way to think about this is to basically have a safety net. So anything that doesn't get handled in a higher priority rule um, will pass through to this default rule. And, um, you know, we can set that to do whatever. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to be rule, which is going to drop all unhandled packets. Um, so that we're just going to do this to make things a little bit more secure. Um, so the way that we do that is with IP tables. Basically all these commands are going to start with IP tables. I'm going to use dash P. The chain that we're working with is input and we're going to have it drop by default. Okay, And we can verify that this has happened um, just by taking a look at um, this. Let me clear this so it's a little bit easier to see. So now you can see chain input and the policy is to drop. Uh, for the other, these other ones, uh, the policy is just to accept. So think of policy as being the default rule. Um, anything that isn't handled specifically by rules that you've set up, uh, we're going to drop. So now you'll notice that we've created an issue uh, where Basically, we cannot use the internet at all because uh, all of our packets are being dropped. Um, so we're going to have to uh, set up some other rules so that doesn't happen because it is useful to be able to use the internet once in a while. Um, but keep in mind, when we're setting up these rules, uh, order will count. Absolutely. So let's take a look over here. We can go in and you can see that uh, this is just going to add some... Um, these are different ways that we can set up rules, basically. Um, so A is going to append to the bottom of a chain. I is going to insert at the top of the chain. Uh, we can also specify where we want to set things up in the middle of the, in the chain. We can set a specific location. Um, we have different chain names over here. So we have input, output, and forward. We can also change and specify another uh, chain name. We can specify protocol. We can specify like a combined protocol. Uh, we can specify IP addresses uh, for the origin and for the destination. We can specify ports. And uh, we can basically use dash J to specify the action that we want to take. And we have accept, reject, drop, and log. Uh, the difference between drop and reject here, I think, I believe, is um, if you reject it, the the origin knows that it's been dropped, rejected, but drop just looks like it's like our server doesn't exist or something like that. So it doesn't really respond with any sort of like error message. I could have that wrong, but uh, I'm pretty sure I don't. So what we're going to be doing is adding these commands over here. So I'm just going to do that, and uh, we'll take a look at how IP tables output has changed. 
Uh, so actually, let me just do that right now. I'll just do it live. Okay, so here we go. Uh, I'm going to do IP tables. So dash A again is going to append. Uh, so far we have no rules, so this is going to be the beginning, basically. I'm going to use, this is going to be, we're, we're working with input. Um, I'm going to type in LO, so I believe that's the interface. Loop back, and the protocol is all, and dash J, accept. And I'm going to make sure that's all uppercase. Okay, let's take a look at what, look at what we've done here. So, accept all. Uh, from anywhere basically. Let's add the next one. Gem state state So in this case uh, established or related um, this might be that we're just like not allowing new connections, but anything that's been established, we're going to allow it to come through, basically. So we're gonna do that. And we'll add one more. So now the protocol is TCP. Uh, the port is 80, so if you know what port 80 is for, then congratulations. Port 80 is used for HTTP traffic, and we're going to choose to accept that. Okay. So let's take a look at what we have so far. Uh, we've set up three rules, and once again, um, the one at the very top is uh, going to take precedence, followed by number two, and then number three. And if you want to get more information about that, we can go verbose and we get a little bit more information. So here we can see that the interface that we're using would be loopback. Loopback is very safe uh, because loopback is just sort of like a very private virtual interface. Um, these other ones are specify, you know, like um, specify anything. So our actual Ethernet port would be covered under this. So the next thing we're going to do, and uh, they're going to ask you to um, let's see. We're going to issue an IP tables command to confirm that there is an exception rule to handle incoming TC packets over port 80. And we can use uh, your web browser to confirm that you can now browse the internet. So let's try that. Let's take a look. Uh, let's go to Google. And we seem to be able to navigate around just fine. So, yep. So you can see uh, that the next part of this is going to require a friend um, to be working with. So what you're going to want to do is uh, find out your public facing IP address. So that's not the, the uh, private IP address that we're using within the lab. It's not 192.168. Um, it's going to be the public IP. Um, the public IP, let's just try this. I'm going to do... Uh, so I'm going to try to type in IP address here. And most likely, it'll give me uh, a public facing IP address. So this is mine. Um, and what you're going to do with this is um, provide the external facing address to a lab mate, and they should try to ping you. They will not be successful because, as you know, we're you know rejecting everything, basically. Um, the command that you're going to have to enter is IP tables input. The protocol is ICMP, so ping does not use TCP like a normal HTTP connection. It's using ICMP, which is slightly different. Let's specify that ICMP is what we want to use, and then we're going to use the dash S, uh, the external facing address, and we're going to accept those. So once you do that, you should be able to accept um, IP traffic. And the next thing that you'll do after that is you're going to set up a rule that's similar to that um, in order to allow SSH connections. Okay, so if you remember, the port that SSH works on is port 22. And so with this, we can add a lot of um, specific rules in terms of like, you know, 
accepting SSH traffic from maybe only one location. Okay, and finally, the last little bit of this lab um, is where we reboot our system. And once you reboot the system, what you'll find is that all of those IP tables rules that you've created um, were not persistent. Uh, they are lost on reboot. And so the procedure to make things um, permanent is to basically uh, follow this rule over here. So the first thing we want a um, backup of the IP tables rules. To do that is this command over here, copy sysconfig IP tables. And we're just going to create a backup file with the .bk there. And then to make the IT, IP tables rules persistent, um, if you issue the command over here, IP tables dash save to Etsy sysconfig IP tables. So the persistent rules, the ones that we enact or enable on startup live at this location Etsy sysconfig IP tables uh, that is something that will come up in tests and practicals and stuff like that so um, this part of the lab is very important take a look at that okay um, so once you're done through all of these steps we should be at the end of the lab and you can run the check and answer these questions okay thanks a lot